Hello everyone, my name is Nathalie B. I'm with Be Mindful. Uh, today we're going to talk about honeybee biology basics and this is the first in a series of several educational videos that we hope you will find useful if you're getting started in beekeeping and you're needing some um, educational material to get uh, learning and you don't necessarily have access initially to colonies of honeybees to learn hands-on. So let's get started. Without further ado, I'm going to share my screen uh, so that you can follow along with me. And if you have questions, I will tell you how you can get a hold of us at the end of this presentation uh, because this is recorded and uh, it's not interactive. However, you're always free to ask us questions by contacting us at the end of the uh, slides you will see our contact information so let me share my screen real quick here we go uh, again this is basically natural beekeeping 101 and today we're going to talk about uh, honeybee bi biology uh, just the basics basically so that you can follow along um, in your journey to learning how to be a beekeeper okay so this is very important uh, for all beekeepers, by the way, to learn about the biology of a honeybee, because without that understanding, you're not going to be a successful beekeeper. Um, my name is Natalie B. I'm a master beekeeper. I'm also the president of the Hayes County Beekeepers Association, a director at the Texas Beekeepers Association, and a chairman of the board at Real Texas Honey. As you can see, <laughs> I live in Texas, so what I'm uh, discussing, we're going to try to make it general so you're not um, it's because all, all beekeeping is hyper local. So we're going to try to stay in general terms right now and not specifically to Texas. I have the immense chance and privilege of working with my dear friend and mentor uh, and uh, business partner, Les Crowder. He's an expert craftsman beekeeper. He's been beekeeping for over 45 years. Uh, he's also a trained biologist. And he's a published author of a very successful book. Together, we have over 55 years of beekeeping experience in Langstroth, Tabar, or horizontal hives, Layans, uh, Ware, all kinds of hives. I'm also the um, host of the Natural Beekeeping Corner on the Hive Jive podcast. A new episode is published every first Monday of the month. If you're interested, the Hive Jive podcast is also an interesting uh, listen uh, with John Swan and Ken Marlon in the first three seasons, uh, where they teach you all kinds of things beekeeping. So if you um, have uh, an interest in listening to podcasts, um, that's your place. And Les, as I mentioned, is a published author. Uh, his book, Tabar Beekeeping, Honey, Organic Practices for Honeybee Health, is a very well-known throughout the world book. Uh, it's been sold in uh, so many different countries, and it, it's a very good basic for natural beekeeping, whether you want to do tabar horizontal beekeeping or any kind of beekeeping, including Langstroth and vertical beekeeping. So keep that in mind. And together we're be mindful, by the way. <laughs> um, so let's go and dive into the um, biology basics of the honeybee. Um, Apis mellifera is the Latin name that means the bee that carries honey. Um, it, and it's the only honeybee, the only bee that will gather uh, um, a lot of honey uh, in quantity sufficient for um, human beings to uh, harvest. Uh, in quantities that will help feed them, their families, and um, their their fellow um, humans. So, um, the body of a honeybee is made of three main components. There's a head that's going to be the sensory uh, organ of the honeybee. There's going to be antenna for um, capturing uh, pheromones and smells. Uh, a tongue that's also called a proboscis that's going to be used to taste um, different things. Um, it's going to have the vision uh, with the two big eyes and compound eyes and then three little eyes that are going to on the top of the head that are going to capture light and allow them to direct themselves. Um, the thorax is the middle part of the body. It's also the movement, the locomotion part of the body. It, it features two pairs of wings that are attached by little hooks when they're flying and three pairs of legs um, that they're using obviously for walking around but also for collecting pollen. Uh, 
And then in the, uh, the third part of their body is their abdomen that contains their um, stomach, their you know, um, rectum, their uh, excretion, their um, digestive uh, <laughs> organs, and also it will allow them to make wax. It also has at the end of it, the stinger um, and uh, the little holes throughout the body here on the abdomen allow them to breathe. So when we talk about honeybees, we, uh, we have to mention the superorganism. That's a concept that's uh, basically an organism that's made out of uh, smaller uh, organisms, in this case, worker bees in the colony of honeybees. Uh, it's a social unit. Uh, they live together and they work together for the betterment and the safety of the colony. And they divide labor between themselves. So each bee is highly specialized. And also they change jobs throughout their lives based on their age. Uh, there's a queen that's doing the reproduction uh, with, along with the drones and the worker bees do everything else basically. Um, the individuals, meaning the queen, the workers and the drones uh, each on their own are not able to survive. Uh, they need each other to, to survive and function. So that's also why it's called a social unit of EU social animals. Uh, best example um, that uh, people know is a colony of ant that has a queen that's laying all the eggs and the workers do all the work. It's the same with a colony of termites, which is also a superorganism. Uh, the queen has the standard abdomen. She's really very different from the rest of the females in the colony. Uh, and the females uh, will do all the work um, for the queen and for the betterment of the colony. It's the same thing with the colony of honeybees, by the way. And the very famous uh, queen here in the center, along uh, with a group of worker bees, um, is going to be an example of that uh, behavior. So a queen is going to be um, in the middle of a swarm. She's going to be in the middle of the colony of honeybee um, in a cavity or in a hive. And she's going to be the king, the, the, the uh, most important uh, bee for the uh, reproduction of the colony, but every single bee will have a function and will help uh, the colony survive. Some definitions so that we are all on the same page uh, when we are talking about uh, biology. So honeybees are the individuals, uh, the single workers usually, um, and um, they're basically those units in that group, the honeybees. A swarm uh, or a colony, let's start with a colony. A colony is a group of bees that usually contains a queen, uh, many thousands of workers and potentially some drones. So a colony can be uh, in a hive, which is a man-man box or a cavity, and or it can be traveling. And when the colony is traveling in search of a new home, it's called a swarm. Uh, and it's part of the reproduction mechanism of the superorganism. Uh, the individual queens will make um, babies, but the uh, colony of honeybees will also make babies by splitting itself in half and sending off swarms. That's the reproduction of the superorganism. So a colony uh, can be in a cavity, can be um, so, uh, traveling as well, but when it's traveling, it's called a swarm. A hive is actually a man-made box in which beekeepers put colonies of honeybees uh, in order to, um, grow, to harvest honey or grow bees or do pollination, all kinds of things. Uh, but it's basically the box. Uh, and it can be made with very basic materials like barrels and or reclaimed materials, um, organic, you know, it could be bamboo, it could be all kinds of things, depending on the kind of hive that uh, you're looking at. Sometimes a hive uh, is, the word hive is used for a colony in a hive, uh, but really technically those are two things different. And the colony is the group of insects and the hive is the box or the cavity in which they live. An apiary, um, is basically a collection of beehives in a bee yard. Uh, you can use the term apiary or bee yard interchangeably. Um, in this case, those are uh, much fancier boxes that require a lot more 
uh, woodworking skills, um, they're, they're more delicate as well. So uh, brood, what is brood? Brood is basically all the stages of um, the, the unmature bees, meaning from the eggs to the larvae that are getting bigger and bigger, all the way to the pupae that are capped under wax and undergoing transformation. And just before they uh, emerge as adult bees. So that's the brood is the group of babies basically. And then when we talk about honeybees, uh, we also will mention the term food or stores sometimes, what they're storing for themselves. But the food for the honeybee colony is going to be, uh, you can see some shiny little cells here, that's some nectar. And then the colorful orangey cells are going to be pollen stores. And then you can have when the nectar is cured and uh, ready to cap, um, you're going to have also honey. So anything from nectar to pollen to honey is the food for the honeybees. Now let's talk about the occupants of the hive of the colony basically. Um, each colony will in theory have only one queen. Um, she's going to be the mother of all the bees in the colony. She's the only one that will lay the eggs when the colony is healthy and functioning properly. Um, and she will look like a torpedo. She's gonna be longer than the other bees. She's gonna have a shinier and broader thorax than uh, the other females. Uh, she's the only reproducing female in a healthy colony. Um, it will also have uh, anywhere from 5,000 to um, 80,000, potentially more in some circumstances, but rarely more than 60 um, workers, which are also females, uh, the ones that are doing all the work uh, in the colony, tending to everybody and collecting food. So the difference in size is um, um, the uh, one of the differentiators. The queen will have an abdomen that sticks out past her wings where the honeybee is not so much. Um, and then this is a real picture of a queen right here on the right side and the worker bees, they're a lot smaller, which makes it easier to find the queen in the thousands of workers that are in a colony. And then at certain uh, times of the year, uh, there will be drones, which are the only males in the colony. Um, and they will be anywhere from a few hundreds to thousands of drones in a strong colony that's able to uh, expand the resources to grow uh, those for reproduction purposes. And the drones have eyes that touch at the top of their head. They're also very bulky. They have an abdomen that is bullet shaped and they look significantly stronger. They also make a, a, um, a strong... Uh, louder noise when they're flying around. It sounds like a, a bumblebee or a helicopter and um, they are um, often mistaken for the queens. So just keep in mind these sh sh general shapes and then we'll give you other tips on how to recognize them in the hive. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about the queen and her importance. So like I mentioned, uh, in general, in a healthy colony of bees, um, there will be only one queen. She will be the only one laying the eggs. You can see one right here. Uh, she's laying an egg. Uh, she's uh, about to deposit it at the uh, bottom of those cells, those hexagon cells. You can see here her abdomen sticking out past her wings. She's uh, a little bit shinier usually because the bee, she's not as hairy and, and as the workers and the workers tend to her on the regular basis and this is called a retinue and this uh, sometimes helps uh, beekeeper finding the queen because you're going to have that circle of bees uh, basically cleaning her licking her taking care of her waist feeding her and just making sure that she's there and healthy uh, another retinue here this queen is marked so that makes her a little bit easier to find another example of a queen here so she's going to lay eggs in the bottom of those cells. And once those eggs hatch, they will start growing and they will be fed uh, a lot of royal jelly or worker jelly. Um, and uh, it's a good sign when you see that much, basically bee milk in the bottom of the cells for developing larvae. That means they have enough food. Uh, so this is kind of what the queen does. She lays all the eggs in the colony. It's important to know that a queen 
will mate with drones. Um, she will get out of the hive uh, one time when she's first um, emerged from her cell as a virgin queen. And within a week or two, she will go out and mate with up to uh, 20, uh, potentially more, but an average about 15 males, drones. And um, that means that she will keep all that sperm in her body and keep it in reserve to produce females. So what happens is that when she's using sperm, when, the, when uh, she's inserting her a father's genetic into the eggs, the egg is fertilized and all the fertilized eggs will turn into females, whether it be workers or queen bees. Uh, and then if the egg is not fertilized, then it will turn into boys, drones. So in effect, you will have the females will have double the genetic materials, double the chromosomes, and the drones only have one set, which is what we call uh, unfertilized boys, haploid, half, and then the females fertilized eggs, diploid, twice, double, right? So uh, that's a haploid, diploid reproduction. Uh, what that means concretely and in simpler terms is that uh, the boys don't have any fathers. They do have grandfathers because the queen has a father, but they do not have fathers. And then the uh, females in the colony, whether it be workers or queen bees, do have a mother and a father. So everybody has a mother, but only the girls have a father. Uh, the queen is super important, and uh, one of her main function is regulating the colony through her pheromones, her smells. She has a lot of glands uh, on her body that emits a lot of different chemical signals, pheromones, in particular those uh, queen mandibular pheromone on her mandibles, and um, some hypopharyngeal glands in her, she's got glands in her head as well. Um, and what that does is that it sends a signal. All those smells are sending a signal that the queen is in the colony, that she's healthy, um, and that she's laying properly, that she's well-mated, um, so that everything will uh, be good for the colony. Those smells, those signals, those queen signals will um, basically attract those workers to take care of her in the retinue. They will be used when the colony is swarming and clustering to make sure that the, all the bees know where the queen is. So the, bee, the queen will land in the tree and then all the bees will gather around her because they're smelling her. These smells will also attract the males when it's time to mate um, in, in, at the first uh, part of her life, which by the way, I mentioned it happens uh, within a couple of weeks of her uh, being born basically, and that never happens again. A queen will only mate one time in her life and then she'll be done. And she will use the reserves of sperm she has to make um, female bees. Those signals will also, um, um, their absence will induce um, queen cells in some cases being developed. But uh, even if she's there, you can have some queen rearing in the swarming uh, reproduction of the superorganism. You can also, you can, they also play a role in worker reproduction. Um, if there's no queen in the colony, <coughs> excuse me. Um, the, the worker bees who have never mated uh, will develop their own um, reproduction organs and start laying eggs, but they will not be uh, viable for the colony. They will be just boy eggs because they have never mated. Um, and so that uh, queen signal will help uh, basically preventing that from happening because that's not a good situation for the colony. And those uh, smells from the queen will also um, dictate a lot, of, send a lot of information for comb building, brood feeding, foraging, guarding. So she's really very important and the bees really pay attention to all those uh, chemical pheromone messages from the queen. So what makes a queen a queen? Um, basically, she's never fed worker jelly or pollen and the bees will uh, overfeed it with only royal jelly through the entire larval stage meaning she only gets the good stuff <laughs> and um, the cells are vertical and, and they're really packed with that bee milk but it's specific to the queens that's why it's called royal jelly 
So let's talk about the worker bees now. Um, we are going to, this, the, the worker bees, uh, there are the vast majority of the bees in the colony. Um, they're the females. Their body is made for um, collecting pollen and nectar. Here you see a honeybee on the right side that has a, a little ball of pollen on each of her back legs. She's very hairy, so when she lands on flowers, the static electricity from flight will attract all the pollen from the flowers and uh, she will uh, push it down to her back leg and pack it like a saddlebag and take it back to the hive to feed the babies um, and, and themselves. So let's talk about some of the jobs that the honeybees will, the workers will do over their lifetime. Remember we were mentioning as a superorganism, there's a division of labor, um, different bees do different things on different time. Well, generally speaking, as soon as a bee comes out of, a worker bee comes out of her cell, uh, she will start cleaning that cells and cleaning the cells around her. Uh, she will then start uh, being a nurse, she will, slowly evolve to being a nurse where she's going to feed the brood, the babies, and tend to the queen and feed her as well. And then um, she will grow into a wax worker where her glands, her wax glands and her abdomen are going to start producing and she will start uh, building comb, repairing comb, um, sealing caps of cells for the larvae to transform and uh, generally just um, tend to the comb and wax in the colony. And then um, um, some bees will turn into food handlers. They will um, gather the nectar from the uh, bees returning from finding nectar in the field and put it in the cells, or they will also um, um, pack the pollen into the cells and generally uh, tend to the food. And then they'll turn, uh, they'll get closer and closer to the entrance of the colony uh, of the hive, and then they will um, turn into uh, climate controllers and help with the um, um, ventilation of the nest when it's hot or conserving heat when it's uh, cold. And they will uh, turn into guards as they get even closer to the entrance of the hive uh, and defend the colony from um, predators or invaders. And then as they get older, about halfway through their life, uh, they will start going out of the hive and foraging for resources, whether it's food, pollen and nectar, or propolis, or water, uh, they will go and fetch all that by flying out of the hive. So this is a little complicated uh, graph that will basically explain that um, a bee, a worker bee, will be an egg for three days, a larvae for about five, uh, and then it will be capped, uh, it will be sealed, and it'll turn into pupa. And when it's done transforming under the cappings, it will emerge and turn into a hive bee uh, at 21 days of age. And then for about 21 days as a hive bee, she will do all that inside work, uh, cleaning cells, um, eating and feeding, um, larvae and tending to the queen and um you know um doing the ventilation the food handling the wax building all that stuff and then the second part of her life as an adult bee she will start venturing outside and um taking care of collecting nectar pollen propolis and water that's the foraging stage. And she lives uh, uh, on average about six to seven weeks, depending on the weather. And that's for regular worker bees. There's another kind of bees that we're not talking about today that uh, are long lasting bees in the winter. Um, but for this uh, presentation, we're only talking about the regular worker bees during the summer, the one that you see flying around. Um, so this is a kind of a summary of what happened. She just emerges out of the cell and she starts by cleaning out the dirty comb. And she's going to start about fe uh, feeding larvae at about one week. She's going to start building comb and uh, capping cells. And then she's going to be a food handler. Um, and then about halfway through her adult life, she's going to start uh, getting near the entrance and, and guarding the hive. 
some of those bees will also be undertakers and clean out uh, dead bees or sick bees. And then as she gets older, she will uh, start foraging for nectar, pollen, water, propolis, and she will die around six, seven weeks of age, depending on how hard she works. Uh, the harder she works, the less she's, the shorter her life's going to be. Let's talk about the drones. And again, this is all a, a basic introduction on each of those bees, but the boys are the drones. And you can see here the abdomen shaped uh, body. They're very stocky. They've got those big eyes so that it can better spot the queen. Uh, they've got those strong muscles so they can fly faster and be the first one to find the queens. Uh, the way they look, I like to call them the bodybuilders of the, um, the, the bodybuilders on the beach with the sunglasses uh, of the colony. So they kind of, uh, their, their main job, they have several jobs, uh, but their main job is reproduction uh, and basically mating with virgin queens in the area so that they can pass down the genetics from their colony to um, other colonies. It's uh, the evolutionary uh, advantage of them doing it that way. So here on this picture, you see the three different kinds of castes that we just mentioned. The queen right here, this is a worker bee. Actually, there's several worker bees. And this is a drone that kind of gives you an idea of uh, the scale. Some of the other uh, functions of drones are uh, providing a layer of insulation to around the bird's nest. And uh, I think that uh, they've got other functions that we don't recognize very well and they don't get the credit that they, need, they deserve sometimes. One thing that's important to, reminder, to, remind, to remember <laughs> is that um, drones will, um, will mostly not feed themselves, although they will at some times um, when they're older, they will be able to feed themselves. Uh, but their main, main purpose is really reproduction so that once they will go out uh, and mate with a queen, they will die uh, because their, their body is going to snap in half and they will fall to the ground. But if they don't manage to mate with queens at the end of a season or where there's not, not enough food, they will get kicked out by the worker bees um, because they're no longer useful to the colony. So um, their life is not all <laughs> nice and uh, lazy eating of food like it's all usually portrayed. So let's talk about those development times because that's an important part of understanding how the colony functions. Uh, you have those three main types of uh, bees. So queen, workers in the summer, and then drones. Uh, they all stay eggs for three days. A queen will be the one that develops the fastest and a drone will take the longest to develop because he's the biggest really. And the worker will be in the middle. So as a summary, a queen will take 16 days uh, from egg to emergence. A worker will take 21 days on average from eggs to uh, emergence. Although in Africa uh, in, in some warmer um, climates, they will develop a lot faster and they can emerge as early as 17 to 18 days. So keep that in mind. And same for the queen, she can emerge a little bit earlier, 14, I think it's 15 days uh, in hotter climates. And drones will develop in one, uh, 24 days. Um, so you have first the egg hatches and then it molts several times like a a snake will change, it will molt uh, the, its skin, shed off its skin five times uh, for the workers, three, uh, four times for the queen. And then once it's big enough, it will get capped and uh, spin a cocoon and uh, transform into a pupae, which will emerge when it's ready as a queen. So these are the number of days that this takes place. Same, same general principle for the workers, except it is going to take longer, three days as an egg, uh, about five days as a larvae, and then it gets capped and it's got, um, I think it's about 10 days as a pupae, and then it emerges. Same thing for the drone, those are the principles. So it's important to keep that in mind. Uh, let's talk about the life cycle of the superorganism. Also, we've just talked about the life cycle of the individual bees, uh, queen workers and drones. Uh, it's important to remember that the superorganism also follows a cycle, uh, which is generally 
a period of um, small size when there's no food and it, or it's cold. And then as they grow to take advantage of the forage in the area and store the food they need to survive that next period of cold or no food, they will grow exponentially. Um, and then they will reach a peak and uh, start um, contracting back to a smaller size. In some instances, when they're big enough and the conditions are right, they will swarm and those populations will have a dip before they grow back and, and decrease again. But the general um, look of the life cycle is going to be that curve. And every year they're going to do that. So they're going to have very few bees initially. They're going to start growing in the early summer in, in uh, temperate climates and the num number of bees and uh, will increase exponentially. Uh, so that they can start gathering a whole lot of food. And at some point you'll have a lot of bees, so many that they're gonna feel congested and might actually swarm in the late summer usually, or sometimes in the early, uh, in the spring, if the resources are adequate and the colony is strong enough. And then in the fall, they're gonna start decreasing in numbers. And as the weather gets um, cold or there's no food, they will start relying on the food that they have stored uh, for that period of what we call dearth, which is no food, um, and which can also be very cold. So this is kind of like a, a cycle over two years. You see that cycle reproduces from year to year, uh, and, and it's a entire season's worth of beekeeping right here. Uh, in Africa, you can have two peaks. You can have two growth and uh, season, two growth and contraction seasons. But in each case, every uh, growth is going to be um, possible because of the presence of a lot of pollen. That's what's going to allow them to grow exponentially. And when that pollen availability decreases, when there's no food, basically, the numbers of bees will decrease accordingly. So it's important to let them respect that cycle. All bees, um, all honeybees, whether it's a queen or a drone or a worker, will come from eggs initially. Uh, the queen will lay an egg at the bottom of a cell. This is an egg right here. It's very, very small. It's hard to see. And then the nurse bees will uh, tend to them and feed them uh, a whole lot of food so that they can grow exponentially. They grow really, really fast. And um, this is an example of several sizes of larvae. Uh, once the egg hatches, it's called the larvae. Uh, and um, you can see this one is very big and it's filling almost the entire cell. So when that happens, um, they're gonna cap the cell and the larvae is gonna be uh, 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 first of all, it's going to go to the bathroom for the first time in its life, and then it's going to spin a cocoon, isolating that um, those pieces away from it. And in that cocoon, just like a butterfly, it will undergo transformation or metamorphosis. This is an example of a queen, I believe, that's transforming. And as soon as it's ready, uh, the bee adult now ready to get out will chew through the capping and emerge as an adult. This is important as well. As a beekeeper, you're gonna to wanna to know how to recognize the different cells uh, so that you know what's going on in the, in the colony and if it's healthy. So um, these caramel looking cells right here of a smaller size are actually capped cells for worker bees, the smaller sized bees. Uh, then you have some larvae right here at the bottom. I think you can not really see very well but they would show as um, white grubs or eggs uh, if they're not capped yet. And then you have uh, these uh, bigger puffed up cells are actually uh, drone cells. They're bigger, they need more space for the boys, right? There's some more here. And then if you see, all those are horizontal or almost horizontal. Uh, and then if you see cells that are vertical going down like this, that look like peanut shells, um, those are actually queen cells. That means that the colony is either uh, trying to swarm and making replacement queens, or it's uh, trying to replace a queen that's no longer there. There's ver various reasons for them to build queen cells, but that's something to watch for. And uh, that indicates that something important is happening in the hive.
As a summary, this is a queen right here at the top, and this is a worker bee. Those are the females of the hive. They both have stingers. The, the stinger for the queen is smooth and she can use it several times. She rarely stings human beings. She might use it to kill uh, competing queens. Uh, and then uh, the worker bee has a barbed uh, stinger. So when she stings a mammal, a human, for example, she will leave it in their skin and uh, rip out their, their um, gut so they will die. The queen doesn't die when she stings. Um, and then the drone is the only one that doesn't have a stinger at all. So you can always pick up a drone and don't be afraid of getting uh, stung. This is a summary of the three stages of development. This is a, an egg that the queen lays at the bottom of a cell. It's really hard to see at first until you develop the habit. Uh, this is a larvae that's been fed and, and has grown to its maximum before getting capped. And this is a capped cell in which there is a pupa that's undergoing transformation or metamorphosis. It's important to know uh, that bees communicate through those smells that we mentioned earlier, those uh, chemical pheromones, and uh, they also use a dance language to communicate uh, when they're wanting their fellow uh, bees in the nest to know where the sources of food that they have found are. They will use two different types of dances, a waggle dance, which is kind of like a figure eight that will indicate where food is that's uh, further away than 100 yards. And then they will use a round dance then when it's a, a food source that's really, really close. Uh, the principle of the, wa the waggle dance is that they will use the vertical, um, the, the middle part of the figure eight as an indication of which direction the food source is going to be. For example, here, uh, the bees going straight up. So that means they're using the sun as a reference, by the way. So if they're going straight up on the comb, they're indicating that the food is straight in the direction of the sun. If they're going down, it's, the food is an opposite direction of the sun. And by the same token, if they have an angle, in this case, 30 degree angle to the right of the sun, they're indicating to their nestmate that the food source is 30 degree angle from the sun uh, using the hive as a reference. So they, their frequencies and lengths of uh, their vibrations when they're dancing will help indicate uh, how far uh, these food sources are. So this is a very complex uh, language that they're using to very accurately uh, indicate to their nestmates where sources of food are. So very often if you leave a little saucer of sugar water outside and you find one bee finds it, you wait another 10 minutes and you're going to have maybe 20 bees and you wait another 10 minutes and you're going to have 100 bees and they're going to go back and tell their uh, fellow nestmates where that food source is with a lot of accuracy they'll be able to find it and they do they perform those dances on the comb inside the dark of the hive so they're they're using chemical pheromones chemical messages vibrations dances um you know the um the frequency and the length of those uh, vibrations will indicate something. And also they will offer uh, samples of that food to their nestmates so that they can um, uh, know what they're looking for. So this is a very, very quick overview of, uh, of the honeybee bay bio biology. Uh, it's very basic. So um, if we're gonna have more details in further presentations, so if you have any questions in the meantime, send them to us or wait for the next uh, in the series. Uh, I would recommend if you are uh, able to do that, to join us every Thursday, 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, Central U.S. time uh, to, uh, to uh, join us for the chat with the Mindful Beekeepers. It's basically educational chats where Les Crowder and I live go and, and uh, answer your questions and talk about various uh, topics that can be of interest. So you can find that on Be Mindful Honey Farms on Instagram. Uh, and uh, we also do it via Zoom if that's easier for you to join. But um, we also have all the recordings from the past chats listed there. So if you're interested in what it is that we do when we host those, you're welcome to do that. So 
Um, I think with that, uh, I just wanted to give you our contact information. Uh, you can find us at b-mindful.com, uh, which is the uh, website. You can ask questions there directly. And you can also use bemindfulhoneyfarms at gmail.com um, to send us some questions. And uh, the other thing I wanted to mention uh, is that we have an apprenticeship training program that's a very good program um, that's hands-on. We also have virtual and hands-on uh, beekeeping 101, 202, and 303 classes. We do top our have making workshops, webinars, and video classes. So if you're interested, just give us, a, um, you know, send us a message and we'll help you out with your questions. So let me do this. So if you have any uh, questions whatsoever, email us. Uh, you can text us, uh, you can send a message through the website, and uh, above all, watch for further, uh, more videos in the training series that we're making available for free. Uh, and uh, as always, we want to remind you to be mindful and, uh, and just uh, make sure that you keep your bees as gently and as naturally as you can. Um, until the next video. I want to thank you very much for your attention and we'll talk to you later. Thanks. Bye.